Hello and welcome. We've had the third Sunday in Ordinary Time and it's an exciting Sunday because the Gospel has Jesus calling the disciples to become fishers of men, basically hunting men, changing from hunting fish to hunting men. Come with me, I'll, I'll keep you fishing, but it'll be human beings and souls. The readings become more important because during this period of time, the Pope has expressed an idea to journalists. And he said, this isn't dogma, this is not the teaching of the church, but I personally have a hope that hell is empty. This is rather sweet. It makes him seem an avuncular old man. And uh, one can only say, who can disagree with that? We would all hope that hell was empty. The difficulty is it suggests it might be because it comes from the Pope himself. Well, what I want to do is to honour the, the papal office and I pray for Pope Francis. But he does make it difficult for Catholics because here is Jesus and, and much of the, most of the teaching we have about hell comes from the lips of Jesus himself. And what we find him doing is offering people a choice constantly. It's better to enter heaven maimed, he said, than to go fully able-bodied into hell. Fear God, he said, fear God the Father, who is capable of sending human beings to hell. And Jesus doesn't think, doesn't, doesn't speculate on how long hell lasts and perhaps a desire to speculate on how long hell lasts and to shorten it is corresponds to our desire not to have to face such a difficult reality in my my sort of 15 years or so of progressive christianity i remember finding hell enormously painful i would do anything i could to spare people the pain of the possibility of it i had begun to believe in a god who was more like father christmas much to my shame and now about my embarrassment. And yet people say, how can you believe in a loving God who would send people to hell? So let's think a little bit about the implications. In the readings for Sunday before Jesus collects his disciples and tells them that they're going to hunt souls, we have Jonah being sent to Nineveh. Nineveh is an enormous city. Uh, the people there are living dissolute lives. It's a place of injustice and sin and Joseph, uh, Jonah not liking it, is sent there to tell them to repent or else they'll be destroyed. And he's really quite cross because he's something of a racist when he discovers that they listen to him and they repent and God doesn't destroy the city. But the point about putting it in the context of Jesus telling the disciples they get a hunt for souls is that this is a God who is holy and who exercises judgment, but also mercy. We're not very good as human beings at managing both judgment and mercy, holiness and compassion, because in our world they appear to be alternatives. And yet the concept of hell is absolutely integral to the freedom we enjoy as human beings. Imagine for a moment we didn't have freedom. Imagine for a moment that our choices didn't have consequences. Uh, and then what God would do would simply say it doesn't matter what the moral implications of the life you've made or the, the way you have or haven't struggled, I'm going to bring you to this lovely place in my presence. And the meaning of your life is emptied of meaning because the moral virtue that we have or haven't practiced has no purchase at all. The problem we face is that if God is going to give us freedom of choice, and we love this freedom, perhaps more than anything else we have, it defines us as human beings. The capacity not to be forced to do things, the capacity to discover what is good and bad for our own selves, not to be told them and have to accept them dogmatically, not to be controlled by a divine puppet master who makes us do only the good. No, instead we've been dignified with this terrifying burden and yet exhilarating burden of the freedom of choice. I think perhaps during my life, one of the most exciting things has been this discovery of the reality of good and evil. The discovery of the complexity of my, of my soul, of my consciousness, my unconsciousness. The discovery that <clears throat> there is this deep flaw in me that if God were not constantly merciful and didn't reach out his hand to rescue me from myself, simply because I ask, I would end up in the most dreadful state. 
The only thing that redeems the fear of hell is the nature of God's compassion. But because he's given us freedom of choice, we have to ask. There's a wonderful quatrain, four lines in, in English poetry, about somebody on a horseback, not knowing they were moments from death and being thrown from a horse, it says, betwixt the stirrup and the ground, he mercy sought and mercy found thrown off a horse as he passed the stirrup half a second before breaking his neck on the ground he realized he was going to die and repented the time frame of repentance doesn't matter that's that's where the compassion of god comes in we only have to say lord have mercy and he hears us and mean it look at the wonderful unbelievably encouraging story of the thief on the cross but there were two thieves they both looked on Jesus. One looked on Jesus and remained in the state that he was. The other looked on Jesus and said, Remember me, Lord, when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said this very day, you will be with me in paradise. The gift of freedom of will combined with the compassion of God means nobody has to go to hell. We are faced with a God who died on the cross so that we could be forgiven. On the cross, all the price is paid for all my misdemeanors, conscious and unconscious. I don't, I'm probably not aware of most of them. I'm aware of some of them. And there Jesus pays my price so on the last day I can be declared innocent of all charges. It's Jesus who will judge us as innocent so long as I repent. There's a wonderful passage in Matthew 25, the passage of the sheep and the goats, which is commonly misunderstood. At least it has been for the last 500 years. But before then, everyone had a similar understanding of it, where Jesus says, I'm going to be a judge on the last day, divide the whole of humanity into sheep and goats. And then I will say to the goats, when you saw me thirsty, naked, in prison, etc., and you ignored me, um, and, and you, 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 when you saw the least of these my brethren in that form and you ignored them, you ignored me. Many people think this is a, a, a the recipe, the explanation for universal judgment. But in fact, it almost certainly applies to the way people treated the early Christians who were suffering for Jesus. Because the people who Jesus calls his brethren and the least of his brethren are always his disciples. He doesn't use that term for the whole of humanity, the, the brethren. When, for example, when he talks about who are my mother, my brothers, uh, and my mother and my brothers, they're those who do the will of the Father. And in this particular case, one of the ways in which judgment will take place is the compassion that people show to Christians who are suffering for their faith, because in having compassion for those Christians, they have actually compassion for Jesus himself. St Paul says, if you don't know any better, if you haven't heard of the good news, if you haven't encountered Jesus and you can't respond to him in mercy, then you'll be judged according to your conscience because your conscience knows the difference between good and evil because you've been made in the image of God and you have free will. I don't want to be judged according to my conscience. My conscience has been a bit fuzzy and I've not followed it often enough. If that's the basis on which judgment will take place, I'm in trouble. I want to be judged as a Christian where I cling to the cross and Christ's blood cleanses me from all sin. But what of those who refuse God? Is God to turn them into puppets or robots? Is God to say, I gave you this freedom of choice to love me, to respond in love to me. I gave you hearts that pulsated for me. I gave you souls that missed me and yet you chose to go the easy way and to fill up your souls with other consolations. You chose to block your ears to the whispers of my love. You chose to willfully misunderstand Jesus, to ignore him. You chose to turn your back on the compassionate acts of Christians as they sought to redeem society with both justice, truth and compassion. You chose to reject all these things. What is God to do with these people who choose not to be in his company? Whatever hell is, it is the re refusal or the inability to share the same space as God 
who is holy in a nuclear way. We cannot stand before God without being forgiven and protected by his holiness or being transformed into it, which is what, of course, the intention or the work of the Holy Spirit is. There are a number of different views on hell, that hell it doesn't exist, that it's, it's conditional, it will pass away, um, that, um, uh, that, that at some point people will, if those who go to, to hell will, will lose their immortal souls and will be closed up. We have no idea. These are different philosophical positions and they depend upon readings of time and space outside time and space that are really too difficult for us to grasp. But the problem is that when the Pope says, I want to downplay hell and imagine that it's empty, he demotivates Christians. He devalues the gospel. It makes it look as though all the trouble Jesus went to, to be born, to walk the earth, to heal, to deliver, to teach, to love and to die for us. Well, maybe he didn't need to do it because hell could be emptied. We have to take hell seriously. We have to tell people that it's entirely possible to live in a way that hardens our responses to God in a way that makes us turn away from him. People know what hell is. Heaven and hell already exist in time and space. We have touches of them. We have moments where something is heavenly. Different people will describe those in different ways. They come to us in different ways. We also have moments of dark despair. The fingerprints of hell are very straightforward. They're always the same. They are despair combined with, this is your fault. Many people who take their own lives do so because for a moment they're overwhelmed by the proximity of hell. How God responds to them is between him and them. All I'm saying for the moment is that we know hell exists. We experience it. I've been there. I suspect you've been there too. And one of the reasons why we love Jesus is however close hell gets to us, in terms of accusing us and threatening us and overwhelming us with despair and depression and meaninglessness. Jesus rescues us from hell. That's why it's a wonderful thing to be a Christian. There's a very complex overlap between mental illness and salvation. And it's beyond, it always has been beyond my capacity to be able to unpick the two. All I know is there's some level of integration between them. All mental illness has elements of salvation in it. And to be a Christian is to struggle with sanity and insanity at all times, because ultimately hell is a form of the undermining of the sanity that salvation brings. Why does this matter? It matters because of the way in which the church talks about the presence of God, the gift of free will, the absolutes of moral evil and good. The way in which we talk about that is informed by heaven and hell, by the prospect of being in love forever with God who made us, our heavenly Father, who gave the life of his Son, that we should never, ever suffer permanent separation. This is a truly wonderful thing, particularly in a society where loneliness has become an epidemic. Loneliness is an expression of hell. Loneliness, the feeling that we are entirely cut off from everything that matters, from anyone who loves us, the feeling that we are unlovable, that we don't matter. This is an aspect of hell. We have to go out to a lonely society where people's relationships are fractured and people are afraid and be able to say to them, this hell passes, it can't hold you. God is in the middle of setting you free. And we introduce heaven to our neighbours by allowing them to worship God, inviting them to worship God, to adore him, to, be, to confess their sins, to have a touch of heaven that the Holy Spirit brings. One of the things the Holy Spirit does is to give us a taste of heaven and then make us long for more. One of the reasons we follow Jesus is that having experienced hell and alienation and loneliness, we want the opposites. We want to belong. We want to know who we are in the love of God. We want to know that he, he treasures us, that we matter. He made us as we are, that he affirms our humanity. We want to be as close to him as we can, loved, forgiven and accepted. We can't have heaven without hell. There is no hell without heaven. I would hope 
the Pope Francis finds the vision and the energy to talk about the choice that people have to make. Because in the end, that's how God has dignified us. He's dignified us with this great gift of choice that makes us sentient beings, amphibious body and soul with a conscience. The best thing about being a Christian is that at the last, what we are required to do to enter heaven is to fall on our knees and say, Kyrie eleison, Lord, have mercy. And as we look in the Gospels, we find Jesus stretching out his hand mercifully, compassionately, with love and healing to all those who recognise him and cry out to him, Lord, have mercy. May the Lord have mercy upon you and welcome you into heaven and keep you safe. Today is the feast of Francis François de Sales and he wrote a rather beautiful prayer. He was, he has this little spiritual um, meditation on imagining that your good angel and a bad angel on either side of you, heaven and hell on either side, and you have to choose. And he offered us this prayer, which I think is a good way of ending on his feast day. O hell, I abhor thee now and forever. I abhor thy griefs and torments, thine endless misery, the unceasing blasphemies and maledictions which thou pourest out upon my God. And turning to thee, O blessed paradise, eternal glory, unfading happiness, I choose thee forever as my dwelling place, thy glorious mansions, thy precious and abiding tabernacles. O oh my God, I bless thy mercy, which gives me the power to choose. O oh Jesus, Saviour, I accept thine eternal love. I praise thee for the promise thou hast given me, for a place prepared for me in that blessed new Jerusalem, where I shall love and bless thee forever. Amen.